Well, I would begin with the observation that the hardest thing for any government to do is to avoid oppressing its least advantaged people. And I believe that our prevailing theories of justice are not helpful enough in this problem because they are overconfident that they know what a just structure of society is. And therefore, they are too friendly to they are too friendly to the to the inside to the existing structure and not to the least advantaged people who are, are likely to be outsiders in the political process and oppressed. Uh, justice of the pursuit of accord is more tentative in the sense that uh, a negotiated consensus is the ideal, but I argue that we fail to reach the ideal. That as much as we try to negotiate a consensus to reach a full accord, as social contract theory assumes we can always do, to reach a, an agreement where everybody agrees to this structure of society, what I assume, I begin with the assumption that we cannot reach such an agreement. That as much as we try to create a social contract or a set of rights that recognize everyone's concern, and bring and then bring and then create a structure that no one can object to. What we end up doing is creating an insider outsider situation, a contract that most takes in the wants and needs of the insiders and fails to adequately incorporate the needs and concerns of outsiders. And as much as we try to bring them in, we bring them in, we lose somebody else. Um, and that there is no way to build a solid, uh, a, a, a solid social contract that will not have this insider-outsider characteristic. Insider-outsider problems are inherent to politics. People who get power are never everyone together. Even in a perfect democracy, it is at best the majority who are the people in power, you can ensure is in power, and there's never certainty that well, they will take into account everyone else's needs and desires and, and what's important to them. So in that situation, how we treat outsiders, or as I call them, dissenters, people who dissent from the prevailing agreement, becomes a central concern of justice, a central concern of justice that natural rights-based theory and that social contract-based theories think they've just solved. Oh, we, well, uh, how do you deal with dissenters, people who have rational, reasonable objections to the prevailing social order? I say, like, oh, we don't have those people. We've come up with a social structure where everybody's invested. Well, I, I believe that's naive and naive in a way that favors insiders and therefore allows the oppression of outsiders. So what I believe the demands of justice are is a continual striving for inclusiveness, uh, to widen the accord, and then a minimum interference with the people who will always remain outside of the accord. Um, so issues that I deal with are applied theory of freedom, what theory of freedom goes with justice is the pursuit of accord, uh, a theory of property rights and a theory of political legitimacy. Uh, so justice is the pursuit of accord is an alternative to social contract theory or contractarianism, also constructivism, Rawlsian type theories that are sort of quasi social contract theories. Uh, also rights-based theories of justice, such as libertarian theories or left libertarian or right libertarian theories, where, where you begin with a list of natural rights. Um, all of them stress the need for an agreement. All of these theories stress the need for agreement, but none deliver it. Contractarian and constructivist theories either assume everyone agrees when uh, not everyone does, or 
They assume conditions in which individuals would, should agree, or they believe individuals should agree, but that amounts to giving insiders the power to declare those who don't agree as just simply as, un, uh, un, as unreasonable in the Rawlsian case, or as rights violators uh, in, the, uh, in the case of rights-based theories. Um, so I've uh, constructed a visual that, uh, uh, I've constructed a visual that uh, I hope will help you figure out what I'm trying to talk about here. Um, let, me share, let me share my screen and see if this works. I'm not sure if this visual actually helps anybody, but I will try it, okay? All right. All right, in this, in this diagram, um, um, we imagine the number of people in a court is on the vertical axis. And we imagine time. And we imagine in time, we are getting more and more, we are getting uh, more and more people as if we're moving toward justice, we are getting more and more people brought into accord and getting closer to a truly just society. A truly just society was where 100% of people will come into accord. But at best, we're going to approach that like an asymptote in mathematics, that we're not going to simply get everyone on board. We will lose people in some ways and in other ways, but we're going to be striving to get there and get closer and closer. We're always going to be something wrong. The people uh, that I'm calling signatories are the people who are in accord that society is working for them. They feel like society is working for them. They are invested in society. They feel it's being just to them. Those are people to whom, say, a Rawlsian, uh, a Rawlsian overlapping consensus applies. But the people on the top, the dissenters, are the people who have rational and reasonable objections to it. And you are at this point striving towards it. And the question for social justice is how do we get closer? Uh, that arrow from the you are here point, that arrow going up a long thing. What do we have to do to get closer to justice? And what I'm arguing is we have really two responsibilities. We have the responsibility to strive for wider agreement. What can we do to bring people in? But then we also have the responsibility that we, since we'll never bring everybody in, we have to treat dissenters as well as possible. And then uh, to treat them as well as possible, which I argue means respecting their status as free individuals, which we'll talk about later in today's seminar. What does it mean to respect their status as freedom individuals? And pull and and to have the minimum negative interference with them as we can. All right, and then the next slide. Oh. Um, but what I find that, what I find that mainstream theories are doing, that what, what social contract, constructivist, and rights-based theories are doing, is in fact, even though we are at the you are here point, where we have the centers and we have we have the centers and we have insiders, uh, they imagine what they see the endpoint to be. And then they tell everybody, this is the endpoint. We're going to put in a set of reforms that we believe will get us to the endpoint. And then as it gets us to the endpoint, then we look at if we put these things in place. There will be virtually no true dissenters. If people disagree, they're in the Rawlsian case unreasonable, or in the Nozickian or uh, many other right libertarian case, the people who disagree are simply rights violators. Um, and I believe that's unrealistic, is that they really don't have this formula. All these nice formulas they come up are not that kind of formula. And this is what I mean about JPA being less ambitious. It's not about saying, I got the formula to give us total to justice, but I got a formula for where we are now. How can we as 
be as just as possible given where we are now? And how can we strive for greater justice? And that, I believe, is the best we can do. Justice is in the pursuit of accord, not in coming up with your, your theory that tells everybody this is what you got to do, but in the pursuit of accord. All right, now let me stop sharing of the screen and get back to uh, get back to my uh, get back to my talking. So um, so justice of the pursuit is designed to take the importance of consent seriously and the lack of achieving consent seriously. So we're striving consent, but realizing we don't make it. Uh, we want to maximize the number of people brought into a card, minimize the effect on the centers, um, as I've mentioned. Uh, and this is, and the reason I use the term accord is important because accord is somewhat different, it's different than a contract because a contract applies that you agreed at one time. You put your name down on this piece of paper. Now you might disagree. Maybe now you're like, wow, this contract that, that didn't work out the way I hoped it would. Um, I really hate this contract now, but they say that I would have signed this contract behind the veil of ignorance or when we came from out of the state of nature, however they're framing it. Uh, or I would agree to these set of rights if I didn't know what my rights were, uh, which rights I would, my particular position would, which rights it would involve. They, uh, that now I disagree, but I would have agreed to it. And under the contract or under on the set of rights, you are bound to this contract. And supposedly then there's this idea that you would have agreed. At least the insiders tell you you would have agreed. Of course. By, by accord, I mean, it's a revisable agreement. Uh, my first, the first name I thought of for this theory was ju Justice's non-binding agreement, is that we, what we're striving for do is not a hypothetical agreement of everyone, but the actual agreement of as many people as possible. And that's what I mean by being in accord. The number of people who agree to prevailing social arrangements at right now, trying to get as many of those people on board and then trying to harm everyone else as little as possible. That's the importance of accord. And it's always something that you have to strive for. And dissenters, again, I'm defining those as people who have rational, reasonable objections to prevailing social arrangements. Now, here's my argument of why we fail. Why can't we? Why, why have dissenters? Nobody wants dissenters. Well, okay, maybe parasitic people want dissenters, but the idea of justice is we don't want to leave people out. We don't want to have outsiders. Why not incorporate those in? I'd love to incorporate everybody in, but my reading of history is that we have always failed and we will always fail. We fail because we have self-serving bias. The people who are writing the rules are biased in their own favor. They are bad judges in their own cases. They make rules that are beneficial for them and their class. And the farther you get from the centers of power, the less, the more they tell themselves that, oh, yeah, I know what's going on over there. And I've solved all those problems. And they're not correct. Another problem is the idea of system justifying ideology. Uh, we are over... Um, System justifying ideologies tend to prevail in every single society. Insiders control the political process and they also control the major levers of culture and the major cultural ideas tend to be idea, the major prevailing cultural ideas tend to be things that somehow favor existing social arrangements. You do get a lot of ideas from or perform, but most of them are just like incremental steps from where we are, and they take most of the prevailing ideals, ideas as given. Uh, and our overconfidence that we've already achieved this hypothetical agreement, I believe, is itself a system justifying ideology. Um, it hampers us from striving for a wider liberal agreement, and therefore uh, impedes us from uh, achieving the widest agreement possible. 
In other words, belief in a just world is that even people who are outsiders want to believe the world is just because it makes it easier to get through the day. It makes it easier to have hope in your life. If you believe that, if you believe that I will eventually get what I deserve. Uh, another reason is that we have principal disagreement about both the good and the right, both what's a good life for me to live and what is the right way for people to interact. What is justice? And most of your prevailing theories uh, believe there's only disagreement about what's a good life, but, it, but agreement about what it is right, or at least they know what's right. And everybody else, if they don't agree, they're just, they're just bad people. Um, that in the one hand, they're, they're not, they're not, they're unreasonably not following a social contract, or on another hand, they're unreasonably just wanting to trample on other people's rights, when if they really thought about it, they would know that this set of rights is correct. And that's just another system justifying ideology. Um, now, what I mean by, uh, by principal disagreement is that people have some not obviously self-serving uh, um, disagreement, um, not obviously self-serving disagreement with the relationship. Um, and we, it's possible that we can have people that have, that have unreasonable disagreement where they just object because it's nuts. It doesn't put them first, but we also have a possibility that a lot of people who are objecting to our situation, actually, we're not being fair to them, is that our, our systems don't, that our system simply isn't being fair to them. Another reason we tend to fail is that the core might not exist. In bargaining theory, it's very possible, especially in multi-person attempts to bargain, that there simply is no core. There is no core to what will make everybody better off than their starting point. That's extremely possible in bargaining situations, yet in social contract theory, they just pretend that possibility doesn't exist. Uh, often they do that by just thinking, well, the alternative is so horrible that uh, that uh, we don't have to really do much to make it in your interest. Um, and there's no agreement about what is a, uh, what is a legitimate starting point. Um, what is the correct reservation point or the non-agreement point? For Hobbes, and most people just invent one. Hobbes says it's this horrible state of nature. For, uh, for Rawls, it is, it is this hypothetical uh, veil of ignorance. Um, and so forth. Um, and we also, we have a lack of information. Uh, we can't find the closest approximation of the core. Uh, and, and we're likely to misidentify the core in a specific way. We are most likely to lack information about the least advantaged people, the people who are farthest from the center of power, who are most disadvantaged, we're going to have the least information about them. But our self-serving bias is going to tell us that we already know enough. Oh, yeah, we've treated those people well. Sure, sure, we know all about them. Um, and it's just simply not true. Another reason is that many, many decisions have no other character than what we want. Should Freiburg have more parks or fewer parks? Um, should we go more on, should we have more public transit? Should, or should we have more of another kind of transit, um, those things are just something what people want. But whatever we choose, some will impose what they want on other people who don't agree. Uh, another reason that we fail is because splitting is not possible. People as different as the left libertarian Michael Otsuka and the right libertarian Robert Nozick, as well as some anarchists of different stripes, just imagine people living in their own consensual communities in which they all get to do things their own way in their own place. That is just simply not realistic in a world where 6 million people live in Munich, 8 mil million people live in Berlin, 16 million people live in New York. They can't all just split up. They have commitments to other people. They can't simply go somewhere. And if they go somewhere and then 
they'll develop ties to their new place and then they'll disagree with those people. You can't, you simply can't escape. It's a sort of a, uh, uh, who was it? Was it Sartre? Sartre, there's no exit. You know, hell is other people. You're stuck with other people. We're not in a world where we can get away with everybody. Uh, Rodney King had it right. We're all stuck here together for a while. Justice has to be trying to get along with the people you're stuck with. Uh, uh, the set, another thing that I, another reason that we can't, the other reason we fail is that the set of natural rights that are undeniable cannot fill out the basic structure. And say, okay, well, we definitely have to have prohibitions against murder. Carl, is that what you're saying? You're saying just there's people who just reasonably want to have murder. Um, no, I'm not saying that people that want to murder are reasonable. What I'm saying is you get these undeniable things like murder. Okay, you fill out a couple of things like that, but then you find out, okay, oh, but this guy gets to own huge amounts of property and he gets to kill people that cross his line or something like that. Uh, or that we're enforcing murder, but actually we do it much, we, we protect this group of people from murder much better than that group of people from murder. Um, and those things, the smaller things, once you, once you get the things that are controversial, you have to get those to fill out structure. And then the final reason why we, why we fail to come up with a just social contract or a true set of nice rights is that we have to do ethics under uncertainty. And it's uncertainty about ethics itself. When, when we do ethics, not only are we unsure about exactly how the world works, but I'm unsure that the ethics I'm doing are correct. Um, I, you know, I, one person believes in a social contract, another believes in a set of natural rights. Both of them thinks the other is wrong. Other people think that ethics comes from, from a particular set of, of religious scriptures. We're all doing this under uncertainty. And the, uncert and the uncertainty implies that we're, that we're not going to be able to come up with an agreement that we all can be certain that everyone will, everyone will grab onto and we will agree. So if dissenters exist, we have to consider the possibility, maybe actually they're not so unreasonable as I think. These dissenters, these dissenters might be, uh, these dissenters might be people that have good, good issues. So for all those reasons, I believe we're very likely to fail. And then the ramifications of that failure is that, um, all social structures are going to be like a club, an insider club. Whatever constitution you put into place is going to be like an insider club. Um, and it's going to end up imposing power on dissenters. And I, and I don't believe every criminal is a dissenter. No, I mean, some criminals are just unreasonable. But a lot of people that we have. Uh, a lot of people that we identify as criminals, some of the people we identify as criminals, and some of the people that just have less advantages than everyone else are dissenters or people or people that really should be dissenters and maybe being fooled to thinking that the, the, the country is actually working for them because they've taken on a system justifying ideology or a belief in a just world. So, so under these conditions, what makes one structure superior to another is that you get at least a majority in a court, hopefully more, but at least a majority. Minimum negative interference with the people outside of the court, the dissenters, and continual striving to bring dissenters into a court. Justice is in the pursuit. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. So let's go to discussion. All right, let's see. So, uh, 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 Dritan, uh, you're the one who, uh, who read uh, toward, um, toward Justice as Pursuit of Accord. Uh, you want to get the discussion going? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, there are three main points that I would like to uh, discuss today. 
First, uh, the article starts with a striking sentence, and quite true in my opinion, that the hardest thing for any society to, to do is to avoid oppressing its least advantaged individuals. You mentioned that in your, uh, as you started your presentation. In uh, principle, I must say that I like your theory. It very much does imply a more inclusive uh, kind of uh, social contract. Uh, while I was reading uh, it, the, the article, I was thinking it's the most dynamic theory I've read until now. Societal structures change over time, people also, their preferences and so on. However, towards the end of the article, the reader is presented with a universal, universal basic income. While it certainly is a plausible proposal in support of uh, justice as pursuit of a court, I will try to connect this with the first sentence of the article and look, and look for uh, inconsistencies. Uh, based on what I've read and what my economic intuition tells me, I am not sure that a UBI would definitely get the least advantaged individuals into a better position. To, uh, to base my uh, argument on this, uh, I'd like to exploit the results of a research paper by Hoynes and Rothstein, in which they conclude that a UBI wouldn't be as beneficial as the existing pro programs for poor households. I would uh, further argue that the more vulnerable, uh, the disabled and the poor, for instance, may find themselves getting less under a UBI scheme, considering that uh, UBI replaces other social security and healthcare programs rather than uh, benefiting from current uh, assistance programs. For instance, in the United States, uh, the average household with a member over 65 receives uh, appro approximately $17,000 in social security and healthcare benefits, which surpasses the amount uh, one could receive under the proposed UBIs. In fact, uh, what we could potentially see in a UBI scheme is that the most vulnerable find themselves on a lower indifference curve. Uh, I think this also counters John Rawls' distribution of justice, distribution justice, and the maximum principle too. And my second uh, thing that I'd like to discuss today is uh, I can't seem to understand how UBI uh, directly connects to political rights. I know you mentioned somewhere uh, political rights in the article. I, I believe that the more economically free one is, the more politi politically free a person is. I live, uh, for example, I live in a multi-ethnic country. And some decades ago, uh, the ethnic group that I belong to, I am uh, Albanian, by the way, was marginalized to some extent. So we could be also considered dissenters in this case. I feel that uh, a UBI wouldn't be the right compensation for my liberty to learn in my mother language, supposing that's not possible, or to require information from institutions in my mother language, or that my ethnic group uh, isn't represented in due percentage in the parliament. Ultimately, uh, Given the government, the role of direct provider in this case may seem a bit scary, supposing that the ruling coalition could be uh, ill-intentioned and the power could be in the wrong hands. And it feels like it buys us our voice by financially compensating us for other intangible rights. Uh, I think there isn't a one-to-one -one equivalence in such cases. And this brings me to my third and last point. Uh, this is more of a comment and a question too. Uh, the second best approach uh, seems to be plausible to me. And the uh, JPA could certainly, or at least to some extent, remove a uh, cancel culture that we see today. And of course, in the past, uh, we are seeing a lot of it, in fact. I think it's a good way to unmarginalize dissenters or villains uh, who deviate from popular opinion. But on the other side, I think dissenters are healthy because they challenge the ruling coalition. So it's, we could see that as some kind of uh, moving towards uh, a better future by, challenging, by, by uh, be, by the ruling coalition being challenged by the opposition, or in this case, the dissenters. So uh, let's think, uh, I'm thinking of it as a ruling coalition versus the opposition. 
I wonder what could be the uh, political implications of this. Uh, in a democracy, uh, the ruling coalition will necessarily impose their policies over all other people who don't agree with them. And you argued sufficiently what, about what could be done. I'm wondering whether in this case, a double majority mechanism or a consensual democracy for people affected by a particular policy can eliminate dissenters uh, and of course the insider outside insider outsider problem and whether it is aligned with the justice as pursuit of a court okay great okay Dritan. okay now this is Dritan. that was really good three three you know very pointed comments um some fundamental some to the application which uh i didn't talk as much about the application um so i left i left Dritan. Uh, I left in the and the application is in the paper, um, so I left Dritan connecting the dots there for me. Uh, sorry about that, Dritan. But um, what I would like to do with with all the future discussions is to, when you've got a good division of your of your of your uh, of your paper like that, um, to uh, or your paper, your 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 discussant role. When you've got it divided into these points, uh, discuss each one one at a time. So do a very short presentation on your first one, get people talking about the first point, then go to your second point, get people talking about that. Okay, so everybody who's going to be discussing the future, that's that's the way to go about it. Now, so uh, I'll first reply to all of those. Yeah, the basic income connection. Not all basic incomes are good. Um, and uh, and things can go wrong. Basic income is not the end of social justice. Things can go wrong under a basic income society. And I think you pointed out like the danger in justice, the pursuit of the court, is they remember they remember the basic income and forget the pursuit and the accord uh, that they say, oh, well, we paid off you to centers. We're not asking for anything from you. You go, you live on your basic income, and the wool is going to control everything. We're going to make all the rules. We paid you for that. That's not the way justice pursuit of the court works. You've got to strive for all of those things that will bring people in. Uh, equal representation for everyone. How do we make sure every voice is heard? Our, our, our Is our selection process for people in the legislature set up that it's going to shut out these voices and get those things out of there? Those are also responsibilities of social justice. The basic income comes in, in part because you do all the things and you will still fail. Um, and the basic income has to be large enough to for people to really live on and pursue things like that. So if your language is being shut out by the people with prevailing language and they're not doing things that they should do, such as subsidizing, subsidizing schools or something for you to, for, for people in your group to learn your language, you could pay, you could create those with the money that you have. As people get out of their school learning the dominant language, you create this. That's the basic income. It's supposed to give you it's supposed to be kind of the backstop last rule to uh, the backstop last rule to when they fail on this, we we have some resources that we can use to counteract it. And it's not always going to work. Um, you can have a basic income society that is not an independentarian society. That's for sure. It's not an independentarian society. All right. Um, now let's open up. So Dritt, Dritton and I have talked. Anybody else want to come in on this introductory issue? So we're talking just this first point? Um, no, we're talking about anything to do with uh, with the presentation I gave and response that Dritton made. Wow, good time I ran. <laughs> well, it is um, it 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 is it is not something that we have to uh, it's it is not something that we, we absolutely have to discuss more thoroughly. 
because some of the other stuff actually might spark more discussion. It's a little more applied. Uh, oh, Dritan, I guess I should give you a chance. Do you want to respond to my response? Uh, yeah, uh, there, there was something that uh, you didn't explain. It was my third point, and maybe I confused you about it because it was so condensed. My discussion was condensed. So I was uh, uh, suggest I was asking, in fact, uh, what, about the political implications of uh, of the of that. Uh, I, I, I said earlier that in a democracy that the ruling coalition will uh, definitely or necessarily impose uh, po their policies over all other people. What could be done about this? I mean, uh, does a double majority double majority mechanism or a consensual democracy of the like that the European Union has or the kind of Belgium has? Uh, for people affected by a particular policy would eliminate dissenters or would uh, create a more uh, inclusive, uh, let's say, social contract and would also alleviate the insider-outsider problem. Oh. And I, I also wanted to know whether that is aligned with the justice as pursuit of a court. Uh Yeah, I think those kind of mechanisms are, are promising, but I... I I haven't studied those in depth, and I do think they can move us in that direction. Uh, but I am completely pessimistic that they're actually going to succeed. Um, that they're, they're never they succeed in eliminating the insider outsider problem. I believe that is an intractable problem that we're just kidding ourselves that we think we can see. And the more detailed stuff of it, I can't really comment because I haven't studied that well enough. Um, and uh, Otto, oh, I should introduce Otto. Otto Lepo is, is also a guest professor here. He was guest professor here um, just uh, earlier, earlier this semester in the, uh, before December, uh, now coming to us from New York. Um, Otto, um, and, uh, Otto comes from a, uh, perspective that's somewhat sympathetic to mine, but it's also a little more sympathetic to uh, libertarianism than mine. And Otto is unsure if he should come in on this or later. So later, I'm going to connect it more to uh, more to my theory of freedom, uh, and then on to a theory of property rights. So I don't know, I have to leave it up to you, Otto, if it's better to speak now or wait till next we're doing my theory of freedom. Maybe I'll just throw in a, a quick question at this point and then I'll say a bit more later, if that's okay. Um, so um, on this question of the insider-outsider uh, distinction and the, and, um, and the pursuit of a court, um, is the, is the, so I'm just trying to conceptualize this a, a bit or to understand if uh, the sort of, um, if you think that the, the main problem is that in current society that there's a, small group of outsiders um, who are a significant enough problem, whether it's the least well-off group, as, as Rawls put it, uh, to, to justify remedying that through these reforms. Because um, um, it's in some parts of your writings, you also suggest that the problem with today's society is more that um, really the majority of people, or perhaps even, or, or a significant portion of the people have to work under a system which privileges the few. And so uh, do you think the biggest problem is that we are kind of all working for the privileged few? Um, or do you think the problem is more that most people may be benefiting, but a small portion, a significant portion of people are not uh, sufficiently taken into account? Okay, my, uh, that's a good question. It's an interesting question. I would say that the first kind of society you mentioned is worse than the second kind of society you mentioned. Um, and, and the second is really about as good as we can get. I think a lot of times we, when, when we strive for bringing everybody in, uh, we actually don't even make that, that second position where you're talking about where, where it's the society really is good for the majority but it leaves out this, these, these minorities. Uh, 
that society is better than one that is just really mostly working for the benefit of a very few. But so many societies, as they say, well, we have the solution that's going to be good for absolutely everybody. They ended up being just for those few people. Um, I think, and I think a lot of our societies today are kind of a mix of that. They kind of work for the majority. They really work for the, for the few. Uh, and they really don't work for a significant number of people. Um, Mavin. Uh, I just wanted to add on that thought that I think um, that the one thing doesn't outrule the other in the sense that you can still be off very bad in a society and at the same time feel like an insider. And so to say um, in a political sense, try um, to ward off like um, worse outcomes, but that doesn't mean that you're doing very well in that society. Yeah. Okay, next, uh, Medha, try to talk loud enough that this camera is actually going to okay. film you. Um, so interestingly, yesterday we had the universal basic income uh, webinar. Uh, I really like uh, Dr. Sarah Zavala, who is an advocate of UBI. So uh, they mentioned how Switzerland is a direct democracy. Mm -hmm. So what they do is, what a person, suppose I advocate UBI, so I gather a few signatures and then it goes for a direct referendum. And then uh, once a majority votes uh, for, for UBI, I suppose, then it becomes binding on the entire country, irrespective if irrespective if the uh, political party in power actually supports UBI or not. So I think something that of that sort would be an interesting solution. But then, uh, would it be feasible in a more populated or a large country? Um, we'll have to experiment and see that. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. Whether it would be, uh, I haven't thought about whether it is more amenable for a, for a large or a small country. I am, the ideal of consensual communities to me is, is a good one, but the physical possibility of getting people to, to actually be in, in one, I find difficult. And also that they often take on their own inside character. It is the people in the privileged communities figure out, well, how can we shut out those unprivileged people, how can we make something that's really good for us here and keeps those other people out? Benedict? I would say that Switzerland is, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thought, but I would say that Switzerland in its direct democracy is a bit of a, an except, a, bit, a bit of an exception uh, as it's rather rich, rather small, rather homogenous, yeah. and it's like the direct democracy is very embedded into its political culture, thinking about applying a Swiss uh, direct democracy in Germany, the whole would be a whole different animal, I think. And even within the very wealthy, very homogenous uh, Swiss country, you still have, I mean, on, on the other hand, it definitely has multiple languages, it's multi-ethnic, you could, you know, you could make pro and cons here. But even within, like, you, there's no denying that Switzerland is small, and even within that, you see that, especially during COVID, you have certain regions that always vote against anything that comes from from, Bern, from the mm -hmm. the capital. So, mm -hmm. like even within this very small country, you have these significant cleavages that you know has posed a challenge in the past two years. But then, you is also one of the very few countries. Uh, Switzerland was also one of the very few countries where the API was successful in its experimentation. So, I think it would be mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, it's an absolutely interesting case study in Switzerland. It absolutely is. Okay, let's get uh, give Dritan the last word before we uh, before we go to the break. Dritan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would just like to add something uh, because I, I uh, heard the direct democracy term come up. Well. Even a direct democracy uh, would uh, create the insider-outsider problem because uh, they would vote in a referendum and the majority would impose uh, their will against the others, which in this case would be considered the dissenters who reasonably might have objected to a particular policy. So 
uh, and my discussion was pointed, my third point was also pointed to what could be done. Uh, I mean, uh, do we need a, some kind of double majority to uh, pass some kind of legislation? So not only a simple majority of 50%, but it could be a double majority of 75% or even a double majority of not only the majority of the, uh, uh, you know, the people, uh, but also the majority uh, of the uh, votes of those people who are affected by, the, uh, by a particular policy or by, a, by an effect to, by an affected group, which in this case are the dissenters, which claim to belong um, to the communities, not in the majority in the population. And in this way, that, that would limit insider's power. I mean, for instance, a veto mechanism may possibly uh, lead to an inefficient governance of the ruling coalition. But as you argued in your paper, the government uh, should treat should treat natural resource, resources as people's endowments and not only look to maximize financial value or efficiency, but also take into account other ma matters of value creation. So that's my... Well, that's, that's interesting and important, but we got to get on. Um, so I'm going to have to cut it there.